Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the Toronto Air Seminar. And uh, today's session will be the last session for this semester. And we will resume our seminar after the winter break. Uh, so hope to see you again next year. And uh, today's talk is brought by uh, Kurt Davish um, on shared autonomy from human robot collaboration to humanoid robot teleoperation. Um, Kroos Davish is a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, Computer Science and Robotics Institute at uh, the University of Toronto and also a member of the Vector Institute. He's currently working on AI solutions and autonomous robots to accelerate the discovery of new materials. Previously, he received his bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering from KN2C University of Technology and the Sharif University of Technology. Uh, in 2019, he completed his PhD in bio bioengineering and robotics from the University of Genoa, Italy, where he developed a novel te a techniques for human-robot collaboration. Uh, from 2018 to 2022, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Italian Institute of Technology in Artificial and Mechanical uh, Intelligence Lab. Uh, during, the, during that period, uh, he worked on human motion, uh, human motion perception and prediction, humanoid robot teleoperation, and safety enhancement in human robot collaboration. So, uh, looking forward to your talk, Krush, and uh, please feel free to take over. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your invitation and also for your kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today. And uh, my talk today is about shared autonomy. I'm trying to share some of the experiences we had on human robot collaboration and human robot collaboration in that domain. So, first, let's identify what is shared autonomy. Shared autonomy is uh, in the literature is defined as approaches that basically enables an agent to collaborate with a human to achieve a common goal. So, and then the, uh, the general aim of the shared autonomy is to enhance the human performance or assist the human in, in, a, in, a, in a task. Then what are the, some of the key aspects of shared autonomy is that um, uh, basically they should have a common goal that is fixed and, uh, and, and uh, it raises some questions. If the robot is aware of that, uh, that common goal that human has uh, in, in mind, or, or if the robot should infer that goal from the basically interacting with the human and with the environment. And also uh, the environment and human is, uh, are dynamically changing. So, and we have a different range of tasks that human may want to do. So the robot should be able to adapt to these scenarios. Moreover, also uh, there is this question that if also the robot is aware of the human in the control loop or not. In the context of PHRI, physical human robot interaction, a shared autonomy is uh, represented by this, uh, by this formula, where uh, the first one somehow showed the dynamics of the evolution of the system, whereas the second term, uh, which is related to the uh, which is related to the input to the robot, which, uh, which is a function of the human input, agent input, and some theta t, which is uh, this theta t is uh, somehow modulating the uh, parameters in an arbitration function where basically try to blend the human and uh, an agent input or the robot input for finding the final outputs to the, to the, to the, to the, to the robot. Then also shared autonomy is relevant to HRI. HRI is the field of a study to understand, design, shape, and evaluate robotic systems for the use with or by the human. And then going through the literature on that, we have like whole range of uh, basically autonomy from direct control to dynamic uh, autonomy where we, we can have like direct collaboration or we can have peer uh, to peer collaboration like, uh, like similar to what human does together. Then in the shared autonomy, based on the literature, we can identify two types of shared autonomy. And uh, the first type is uh, called what is so-called peer collaboration. 
where the input of the uh, human agent and uh, human and the agents, they are independent and through a blending function, they are combined together and provide as an output to the, to the, to the robot. Or in the assistive robot, uh, robotics or interoperation, where the user provides some uh, basically output signals, you, and uh, agent signal depends on this, uh, the input from the human, and then it computes the final signal to be provided to the actual robot. And in this talk, Basically, uh, we will uh, go through some of the techniques that we have developed both for peer collaboration and for teleoperation. And the first part of it is related to the peer collaboration. So this work has been done when I was uh, during my PhD at University of Genova and where I was working on human robot collaboration. So our main motivation was related to industry 4.0 where we, we, we have like consumer and demand driven market and we would like to have customized products. Combined with the shared autonomy challenges, we, we identified a number of challenges that should be addressed by this work. For example, uh, our, our agents should be able to work in a dynamic and semi-structured environment and in an uncertain environment where human decisions are not defined uh, beforehand and the robot should infer it. And then uh, also we have all the uh, problems related to the computational problems. If we want to solve a, 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 a complex collaboration problem ahead of the time, uh, uh, they may not be like efficient, and then uh, like yeah, so the, the the collaboration should be designed such that it should be easy for a user, uh, a non-programmer user, a non-expert user to to interact with, and and also have giving the 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 the, the user the authority to make maybe some certain decisions. So. Um, in more specific, in our proposed architecture for uh, for media assembly scenarios, we are taking into account the following points uh, in in this design. So we want we would like to have like to be flexible at the task level by that, uh, which is related to the customization uh, or customized product, and then the um, we, we would like to have also flexibility at the team level. So both the human and robot agent should have a certain level of authority, which uh, together it increases the robustness of the whole collaboration process. Also, it should be, be able to scale to more complex scenarios and uh, allow online adaptation to the human decisions, as well as also asking for help from the human if it cannot. Thus, it should be natural, intuitive, safe, and transparent as well, this, this provided the architecture. So, uh, what is our uh, um, idea here is that uh, we try to uh, use a, a divide and conquer paradigm where we have a, a modularized a development of the architecture. So for different tasks, we may use different parts of this architecture. And then we have hierarchical architecture and a loop of perception, planning and action loop together. So how does it work? So basically, we perceive the environment or the human first, then we go to the uh, planning loop, planning and let's say simulation loop, where basically we define to, uh, we, we try to find a, a plan of actions for the human or the robot. And then by simulating, we see if them, they, they can do that. And then who can do it better and how we can optimize to reach the, the collaboration goal. And, and then try to perform, exe execute a part of the collaboration, and then again, perceive how it works and, and, and do this loop continuously to reach the common goal of the collaboration. So as you can see here, one of the first key points here is perceiving the uh, both human and the environment. First is related to the human action recognition. So basically we're trying to uh, respond to the question of uh, what human is doing. And in this case, we have developed uh, uh, this architecture, which is a, an extension of the architecture proposed uh, by a colleague of mine. So we used a IMU sensor uh, of the smartwatch worn by the user, 
And then we uh, we, we do uh, in the offline, we have two phases, both offline and online phase. In the offline phase, basically we model, uh, and we model the, 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 the basically the human actions. And in the online phase, given the current acceleration data on the models of the human actions, we compare them and try to find like what is the human doing. So in the data pre-processing -pre a step, first we, uh, when we get the raw acceleration data, then we apply a medium filter to, uh, to filter the noise, then a low pass filter uh, in order to compute the body and gravity uh, acceleration terms. And from there, we, we uh, after that point, we try to find uh, the features of the of the of our models, and we use Gaussian mixture model and regression to model the human actions. And and uh, in the online phase, as you can see here, we use Maranovic distance in order to to compare the online acceleration data with the with the human uh, modeled actions. Here we can see some of the result where in the offline phase for an screening action, here are uh, some of the data that we have collected. And here we can see the, both the body and gravity acceleration for uh, the, the GMR models. And then in the online phase where we get, when we get the raw acceleration data and we through, go through the pre-processing step and then the comparison, then we can compute the possibility patterns of different actions of the human. So as you can see here, first, for example, human performs pick up, then a screwing and then put down. And when the possibility reaches its maximum, we recognize the human actions. Then uh, next uh, question to answer is that what is the status of the workspace in a, in a collaboration scenario? And to do that, we extended the work was proposed by a colleague of mine, where we use the get the point cloud data, we do the downsampling and depth filter. After that, we apply clustering by uh, basically first finding the support plane using RANSAC and then using some of Euclidean distance uh, clustering. And then after that, we use a uh, RANSAC for classification and apply a PCA for geometric feature extraction. Finally, also, we could find the uh, different features of the objects, including the manipulation frames that are necessary to manipulate the objects in a collaborative assembly scenario. And here we can see some of the data related to the, uh, the, the point cloud and their cluster, uh, clusterized basically point cloud in, in, the, in a table assembly scenario with four legs. So here till now we could perceive the human actions, we could perceive the workspace. Now uh, we would like to answer to the questions that how the uh, robot should act. And by that, it means that what the robot should do and can the robot, if, if the robot can perform it or not, and if uh, having the acknowledgement if the robot has performed or not. So one of the uh, basically blocks that we have developed is related to the robot execution manager, which it forms sort of a mapping between a symbolic and numerical level. So it gets uh, basically either execution or simulation commands from the higher level, which is task manager, and then it it uh, asks the controller to perform it or uh, or a simulator to perform it. And then using this numerical feedback, it can provide acknowledgement either the robot, yes, can perform that action or has performed the action as we use the information coming from the knowledge base for this purpose. Then we have a closed loop uh, simulator uh, which uh, basically to simulate the closed loop kinematic of the robot. This is uh, really necessary and it was like an enabling approach since uh, with this we could understand if the robot could perform the actions and also how to uh, ground the predicates uh, 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 that, that is coming from the task representation that we'll, I, I will talk about it in a second. Then for the controlling of the robot motion, we use the task priority inverse kinematic where we have both uh, scholar and uh, equality and equality uh, objectives, control objectives coming. And from there, we identify the basically the control task and using some uh, Jacobian relationship and uh, prioritized optimization problem, try to identify the uh, control commands for the robot. 
And here in this case, we can take into account different objectives, for example, safety considerations or joint limits and, and, and so on, or, or like following uh, the desired trajectory. Then now we have these two parts where we can perceive the environment and the human, we also our robot can act in, in, the, in the environment in an assembly scenario. Now we try to answer the question how to represent a collaboration scenario. So for this, we have the first part, which is related to the task representation. So it somehow it tries to guide the collaboration through some intermediate states to reach the final goal or common goal of the collaboration. So for this purpose, we use Android graph. As you can know, it's it's as you as you can see, it's a basically graph with set of nodes and hyperarchs. Nodes in this case represent the cooperation states, and hyperarchs are uh, representing the state transition in a collaboration scenario, which connects the child nodes to the parent node. The, the relation between child nodes in a hyperarch are like and relation and the relation between different hyperarchs reaching the uh, same parent node is, is an or relationship. So we can choose either of those two hyperarchs. And then a path which identify the way that the collaboration progress uh, is basically the, uh, is the number of ways that we can go from the leaf nodes to the, to the, to the root node. And the leaf nodes, they identify the collaboration initial states and, and uh, root nodes, they define the collaboration common state, uh, common goal. For example, in a, a table assembly scenario with four legs, we could find find out that basically there are 255 ways that human or robot could collaborate to reach to to assemble basically a table together. For example, here in this case, either the robot can basically connect the the one of the table uh, legs to the table top. Or it can ask, uh, or the human can perform it, and the robot should understand that and reactively adapt. Or basically, they perform it, let's say, intermediate. So a part of it, the human, a part of it, of the robot, and, and so on. And then we have also extended the Andor graph notion that was presented in the literature. First, we have uh, extended by making it hierarchical under graph. So the idea is that a graph basically is mapping from the leaf nodes to the to the root node, and also hyperarchs are mapping from child nodes to the parent node. Then, what if we can uh, make an equivalence between these two? So at the higher level, we have higher abstract uh, description of the collaboration, and then an, a, an, a hyperarch at the higher level can be a, an Andor graph by itself at the lower level, which it uh, describes in more details how the collaboration should proceed. And then we make this equivalence. Moreover, we have also extended the Andor graph from a propositional logic to first order logic where we have predicates to be grounded. And with these two extensions, we have shown like higher efficiency and higher scalability of this uh, proposed task representation. And it has also been more natural and intuitive for the user. So here we can see a table assembly scenario, both in the offline and online phase, uh, uh, where we have like different number of legs. And as you can see, we have like three different types of Andor graph, like a standard or, or a propositional logic. And the, the, the first order logic, which basically they, they increase the computational time as the number of legs increases, like in an exponential way, whereas a hierarchical Andor graph of performs uh, computationally. Then to show the scalability, we have also performed an IKEA kitchen assembly scenario where we have a full IKEA kitchen, and then uh, which had more than let's say they had around 370 pieces with many more connectors that uh, basically try to uh, assemble this uh, kitchen all together for modeling this collaboration scenario between human and robot. We had used like five layers of Andor graph. In total, we had 32 distinct hierarchical Andor graph and in, in like around a thousand nodes and 500 hyperarchs. Whereas the user defined just half of uh, this amount of nodes and hyperarchs, which shows somehow also it's more easier for the user and it's closer to a natural language of the user for representing the uh, it's such a complex uh, assembly scenario. 
Then we have the knowledge base, which is uh, trying to uh, uh, encapsulate the co cooperation state and the workspace perceptual environment. Here we have also classes or concepts and uh, individuals or instances of those classes and the properties of those classes. So similar to the ontology uh, graph, but with the limitation that it doesn't perform like uh, we cannot do reasoning with that. Um, and then here we, we use this uh, basically knowledge base so many modules can query and provide information to the knowledge base and query those information when necessary. And then finally, we have the task manager that basically put it all, put all these pieces together. So uh, it tries to answer who should do what. So basically, uh, from the under graph or task representation, we have the intermediate states that basically human or robot should uh, reach in order to perform the collaboration. And then here, basically, at each moment of a collaboration, we, we may have different ways of doing that, that basically proceed the collaboration. So we have uh, different ways which are represented by action state table. Then we plan the sequence of actions of the um, of the robot or the human in order to uh, in order to reach the, those intermediate states, and then also we check the state execution coming from the uh, from the human action recognition or robot execution manager, and basically after that we try to find the optimal intermediate states the uh, state that the human or robot should basically. Uh, go for. And then uh, at this point, still we are at the first order logic. So we need to ground the predicates and also allocate actions to the agents. To do so, we make a decision tree. Basically, we have sequence of actions with the parameters that are basically ungrounded. And then we try to ground uh, all those parameters and allocate actions to the agents. We do online simulation, which is very fast. And based on the online simulations, we can compute the utility value. And based on the utility value, we basically ground all the predicates and allocate actions to agents. And finally, we provide the commands to the human or ask the uh, to provide command to the robot or ask the human for help if the robot cannot proceed with the collaboration. Also, as we can see here, when it recognizes the human actions, it can also react. And based on that, it updates its, its uh, basically collaboration state and trying to find, uh, try to infer what is the human basically intention, how it wants to proceed the collaboration. Here we can see, a, let's say, a, 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 a table assembly scenario where uh, also we have shown here the simulation results with the dotted lines and the actual ones with the with the with the, the solid lines and where we could validate that the, the approach is uh, working and then here at each moment the robot has the question of okay they were like at the beginning there were four legs in the worker space robot could take any of those four legs and they have four uh, two arms so in total it uh, had eight ways of doing this uh, basically taking an, uh, a leg and putting it on a screw on this tabletop and a task manager tried to answer this question, which, for example, robot arm should take which leg and to put it on, 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 the, screw, on the screw. So putting all those pieces together, we can come up with this like uh, architecture for the human robot collaboration, where we have perception, get the information from the environment and the human where we uh, try to represent the collaboration scenario and we act with the with the robot or also we do simulations in, in the loop simulations and here we have shown uh, like a, a collaborative uh, table assembly scenario we have as you can see we have four different types of tables two combinations of the tabletops and legs and then, uh, and then the robot basically could, uh, uh, without basically adding any more information to this uh, to this process, robot could uh, basically assemble the table, and and also as you can see, the human sometimes uh, uh, 
interrupt the robot and tries to perform the action. Maybe for some reason, maybe the robot doesn't know, but then the robot gives higher priority to the human actions. At the same time, it happens that maybe the robot cannot perform an action and asks the human to perform it. And then, and, and then the human performs and the robot again perceives the environment and, and, and try to proceed with the, with the, with the um, collaboration. And so uh, while doing this work, we, we intended to do some evaluations with the end user in a manufacturing environment. So with a colleague uh, of mine, uh, uh, which was doing uh, uh, his thesis at Sheffer Group, we tried to do, uh, introduce robots to do palletization tasks uh, to basically enhance the ergonomy in the workspace. Um, and then, here we have shown like three different ways that human or robot could collaborate together. Either human performs all the tasks or human performs the inspection of the, uh, the piece and the robot performs the palletization or the human, as you can see in this one, uh, was stopping the robot and, and trying to do as palletization by itself. And the, the robot was allowing the human to do so. And then we did some also, a uh, user study based on uh, both performance matrices and questionnaires before and after all those um, basically experiments we did. And they have shown that uh, uh, our proposed architecture is indeed is flexible. It increased the comfort of the end users. Also, it has like a, a high success rate, uh, but on the other side, we couldn't validate the uh, uh, enhancing the physical or mental workload on the on the human. So uh, till now, I was talking more about the peer collaboration part. Now, uh, uh, one of the things that are missing was missing till now was that we recognize human actions, and after that, we uh, the robot basically tried to react on top of that. But what if we can predict human actions and motions and to enable some sort of joint action scenarios or for the teleoperation scenarios or assistive robotics as well, where uh, knowing the uh, uh, intention of the human, predicting the human goal and motion can help us to have more fluent and natural uh, uh, collaboration and assistance to the human, basically. So our problem is that given an open setup of self demand motion, we would like to answer the two questions of what is human going to do next and how is human is going to do next uh, as a classification or recreation problems. And we try to answer if we can solve basically these two problems together simultaneously. To do so, first we model the human with a, with a multi-body mechanical system with a Markovian process as you can see here, and then we get only consider only the free floating part of the human motion and dynamics. And then come, uh, getting also going through the literature on the on biomechanics and uh, motor system theory, uh, those studies tend to show that human generates basically motions to minimize some, some cost function, for example, based on the mechanical energy expenditure or motion smoothness. So basically it, what it's saying is that the human generates joint torques in order to optimize some uh, unknown basically cost function subject to some constraint. And then if we apply these joint torques here, we can basically try to model human and then predict how human will behave. So first we did some discretization step where we had uh, the um, discretization steps of both formulas and putting them together, so in, uh, substituting these tau star uh, with, with uh, the, the evolution of the dynamical system of the human, we come up with this formula where we have next human states is a nonlinear function of the current uh, past states of the human motion, interaction forces with the environment in the past, and some hidden states. So these hidden states, basically they try to represent, for example, the goal or intention the human has in mind, the, let's say the task, the context of the task that human is working, for example, social interaction constraints, it can be like obstacle avoidance constraints or timing constraints and so on. So we try to 
basically encapsulate uh, all those unknowns into these hidden states. However, in order to solve the uh, uh, prediction problem, we have to solve this problem recursively, but then can we solve it actually at this time now? So there are a number of problems. First, H star is, is basically is a nonlinear function, uh, which is unknown. And we, our approach is to try to learn it through by human demonstrations. And also we don't know the interaction forces and torques with the environment in the future. So if you know it for the, uh, for the past, uh, especially if we had some sensors, but for the future, we don't know. And uh, we have two options. Either we can model and simulate human and world, or also we try to model the world and the human uh, with some offline demonstrations, which we use basically second choice. And then also uh, for the hidden states, uh, uh, they are known neither in the past nor in the future. So basically we don't know what they are uh, and we should infer them. So. We try to infer them using some sensory data that we, we, we use in this study. And we only try to consider like classific as a classification problem where we try to basically infer the human actions in the future. And basically we try to estimate the probability of human acting uh, an action based on the past uh, sensor information coming. And putting these two, this one and combining these two together basically will have two problems interleave together. One is related to the prediction of the human action in the future, in the next step, and then adding it to the second function where we can predict human states and, 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 and interaction forces and talks with the environment in the future. So in order to solve that problem, we come up with the idea of mixture of expert and we try to extend it. We extended it uh, in, the, in the sense that now the gate outputs, they are forced to, to basically follow human actions. So the gate outputs basically are the probability of human acting and action, and the experts output are the, the future human motion for each of those actions. And then, uh, the, uh, uh, and then with, with some uh, uh, marginal probability, we can uh, predict uh, human, um, future human motion based on the, the inputs to the to, to the to this architecture. And then for the human, uh, we, we solve those human action and motion recognition problems simultaneously in a single optimization problem, where we, for the part related to the action recognition, we have the uh, um, categorical cross entropy uh, loss. And then for the, for the motion prediction, we have the uh, uh, basic MSC loss. And, and um, this is our setup. Basically, we, has, uh, we have a setup like distributed IMU sensors throughout the human body uh, combined with uh, I feel for stork uh, shoes. And then we solve the inverse kinematic problem in the offline phase. Human experts annotate the data and we train those neural networks. And then in the online phase, we, um, after acquiring the data and solving the inverse kinematic problem, which we have, at this point, we have the kinematic states of the human and as interaction forces and torques with the environment, we can infer both the human um, um, actions and motions in the future. So here you can see the result on a 66 degrees of freedom uh, human URDF model. So on the right side here, you can see the, the gray one is the current state of the human avatar. Uh, and then the, the, the red one showing the future uh, motion of the human in 0 0.2 second in the future. Um, then uh, I have to say that also the, we don't predict the base in this case, so they coincide together as you can see in this in this in these uh, animations. On the top left here, you can see the the prediction results. So at each time we can predict the human actions for, for the next one second and it's running at 25 Hertz. And we have modeled three different actions of the human rotating, standing and walking. And below you can see the results of the basically motion prediction. So here is the right knee, uh, right joint knee basically motion. And here is the uh, uh, left foot in the z-axis, uh, the, the, the force, uh, the interaction forces with the environment. 
Also, there are two interesting results. First, when we try to make transient from uh, alter from an action to the other, maybe at the very beginning steps, it, it recognized the like the um, previous action, but as soon as it gets some some data uh, from the fact that human is altering the actions, it also soon it it alter the, the the prediction of the human motion and smoothly change this uh, transition phase. And also uh, here also it shows like M shape, uh, like a stride of the human, which is for biomechanics is quite important. And yeah, so um, again, so, so that was the part for a prediction of the human and it could be used as, as I mentioned before, both for peer collaboration and collaboration scenarios. And this is now the work that I've been carry, uh, carried out at uh, IAT in Italy, where I was working on human robot collaboration. Uh, so here I'm presenting basically a general architecture for a teleoperation system where we have like get information from human, we retarget to the robot motion and robot tries to, to plan and control its motion and then provide us with some feedbacks to the human to increase like the, uh, to provide some, some feedback in order to have better uh, situational awareness and allow the human to basically operate the robot. And in the middle, we may have also delayed communication. Then here in a specific, uh, with, with my colleagues, we have basically, uh, we have made this, uh, this uh, basically set up a system where we get the human motion through some uh, distributed uh, IMU sensors with I feel technology and I feel suit. Then we also have like gloves in order to have like a teleoperation of the fingers of the robot. Also, my one of my colleagues he developed uh, uh, for the the works on the headset where we could basically uh, provide the, the visual and audio uh, teleoperation or feedback to the human, and also doing some facial expression retargeting and eye gaze retargeting of the robot, as well as uh, the part for the um, some omnidirectional treadmill to guide the robot in, in, a, in a navigation and in, in walking scenarios. So, uh, so my work was mainly, the uh, first part of my work was related to the whole body uh, motion retargeting. So basically given the, uh, um, um, sensor information coming from the human, we somehow we want to map it to the references to the robot motion, and then after that we try to solve uh, the um, problem in order to solve the the basically reference commands for the robot. So what did we do? Basically, in in an offline phase, we trying to find a a, a mapping from a human uh, basically. Uh, frames to the associated robot frames. And then online, when we get the information from the, uh, uh, from the uh, human sensors, we can basically uh, map them to the robot uh, references. And we only, for this work, we only uh, use rotational terms so that it allows uh, to have sort of a scalability and generalization over different users. So uh, once we did this uh, mapping, if we change the user, we don't need to do the uh, basically find this mapping again. And then for uh, uh, after we have those uh, references for the uh, robot limbs, we solve, uh, uh, we define a dynamical system and then we solve an optimization problem where we uh, introduce some uh, constraints and generalized constraints. So basically they are a linear combination of uh, joints uh, that are constrained together. For example, the robot shoulder, it was like, uh, mm, um, it was sort of derived by cables and they were like uh, uh, coupled together. And then um, we had like uh, limits on the joint configurations because of the, these cable lengths where we took it into account in this uh, motion retargeting uh, basically framework. And then here we can see the result for 
for the whole body motion retargeting where we could do it um, uh, we solve it in real time and uh, for different types of robots and also for different users and uh, um, one point is that again here we, we didn't do the retargeting for the base of the robots so so you may see some sway motion of of the robots for the, especially like the now robot and then we integrate that uh, kinematic retargeting technique with a walking controller that was uh, developed by my colleagues at IIT. Uh, so this walking controller, uh, first of all, it tries to uh, uh, optimize the trajectory for the, for the robot motion, given the input coming from this virtualizer. So basically it says um, uh, the velocity, um, the, the, the uh, linear and uh, the rotational velocity of the human are given as an input, then um, it size, uh, solve a trajectory optimization problem in order to find like the reference DCM, which uh, stands for um, divergent component of motion. And then combined with ZMP controller and the DCM ZMP controller, ZMP is like zero moment point equivalent to like center of pressure of the robot. And then it tries to consider like a simplified model of the robot with an inverted pendulum where we have like uh, one unstable mode, which is related to that uh, DCM component. And then after solving that, we, we tried controlling that, we have like reference COM motion. And with all the end effector references, we give it to the whole body controller with where it basically tries to control the robot whole body motion while walking. Then we also, um, integrated that uh, the, the retargeting framework with a balance controller can develop uh, by uh, some other colleagues at IAT. So this controller is, uh, is a momentum-based controller. So um, basically it tries to first control the momentum of the of the robot motion and then uh, at a at a higher priority and in the null space of the momentum task it tries to uh, basically follow the uh, postural commands coming from the human so that the robot always uh, can keep its stability while uh, following the human motion also we have done another work on uh, bilateral uh, teleoperation of anthropomorphic hand. So um, a robot hand had about like a 19 degrees of freedom, which were derived by nine motors. It was equipped also with uh, tactile sensors at the fingertips. Also the, the, the joints, they were like tendon driven, they were pulleys and they were like some springs. So some joints, they had like two degrees of uh, uh, basically active uh, freedom and uh, some of the joints, like here, as you can see, they had like uh, uh, passive like freedom, so so that you could only basically uh, control the the joint motion in only one 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 direction, and and the other one was basically drive by a spring. So uh, when we we started to work on on this work, uh, basically, uh, so we use sense club to get the information from the human and provide that optic feedback to the human. So one of the first problem was that how we can model the robot, basically this coupling of the robot, because how is the, how is like those nine motors that are going to drive the 19 degree of freedom of the robot? So what we come out is that like, first we had a calibration phase where we use like uh, it's not teleoperating yet so it's a, still a calibration phase at the beginning when we start the uh, teleoperation so we f first we try to learn a coupling model of the uh, robot hand using like some uh, uh, linear regression techniques and then also we, from there we also different users they have different uh, uh, basically geometry of their hand so we try also to learn or find the retargeting parameters that are going to be used for the uh, uh, retargeting of the human motion through robot. And then, so basically from the uh, human joints uh, are, are given from the sense club, we perform a joint space retargeting to find the basically references for the robot joints, all these joints here you could see. 
And then we use that uh, coupling model, that the kinematic model that we found uh, in the calibration phase and solve an optimization problem in order to find the references for the nine motors of the robot or axis of the robot. And then we apply an exponential filter and to the provide the, the command, the position there command to the low level PAD controller of the robot. In the, in, instead in the backward part, we had like, we used like a kinesthetic data coming from the sensors of the robot and also the uh, references uh, that are set to the robot. And we added some, we have like uh, developed some uh, uh, common filters in order to predict, to estimate uh, the motor references, uh, uh, basically motor values, velocities, and accelerations, both for references and feedback. And then we use uh, impedance control to compute uh, force feedback to the robot. Moreover, also we use tactile sensors for the texture retargeting, as well as also uh, uh, enabling the force feedback or not to recognize if the robot is, is in contact or not. So when we get the raw tactile sensors, we uh, basically find the features of those uh, tactile sensors in the calibration phase. And then we use those features in order to get the derivative and normalized values for the tactile sensors. Then we do some contact detection by basically thresholding. And after that, we use this information to um, provide a, a vibrotactile feedback to the robot. It's both a state-based and event-based. So, so that um, when the user starts making the contact, it has like a a higher like vibrotactile feedback or or when like it has like contact but then the surface um, um, um smoothness changes then also it changes the, the 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 vibration so that human has a like feeling of both together and uh, give provide a better um sort of situation awareness to the user as well um also we noticed that if uh, we, we give like the full vibrotactile feedback continuously to the human it might be intrusive to the human feelings especially for the uh, force feedback then here you can see like the first part where we do the 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 at the first part of the teleoperation where we do like a calibration phase where robot is moving for itself, human is like going to its range of motion, and then robot tries to learn its kinematic model. Human also uh, knowing the range of motion of the robot and the human, we, we find also the retargeting parameters. And then after that, it starts to do the basically the, the, the teleoperation, um, uh, bilateral teleoperation of the human uh, motion to the robot. And then also we could do like different ways, like also like some position, like precise uh, grasping and uh, power grasping and so on. I will show some small experiments we did afterwards. Then here also you can see like where we have like um, haptic feedback where human is touching a box. And here it shows like a uh, 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 basically um, raw tactile sensors data. So in the left side, actually the human uh, robot hand is not touching anything, but as you can see, we have high noises and biases as well, and we find them through the calibration phase. And here, as they get uh, like red, you can see they are somehow in contact with, with, the, with the environment. Then we use these uh, Teleoperation basically set up in uh, Anavatar X Prize competition. I was with the team till semifinal, which was in in, in just this March. Uh, and then in semifinals, we managed to get 95 out of 100 uh, the total score. And then we did uh, many types of also telemanipulation. In this case, we are doing like a referee is doing like a precise um, teleoperation of the of the uh, of the toy. You can see here in order to to pick and place, and um, and then it pro it also receives like both the haptic, uh, both the force feedback and also the the uh, vibrotactile feedback. Then uh, we have uh, another one where the uh, referee was trying to also grasp uh, a glass with a power grasp. 
and then uh, like to do some like uh, handshake with the other referee. As well as uh, we, we did some texture retargeting. So we had like a base here, as you can see. And on the base, we had some bumps. So the idea was that the user should, as you can see here, the user was like sliding the robot hand on the surface of the base. And it should receive some sort of feelings of the bumps on the vase surface. So we, uh, we do, uh, with, with, the, with the approach that I mentioned before, where like we did like event based and state based Bob Retractor feedback, a user had this feeling. And also we had some um, uh, vase retargeting. Which is um, which is not exactly relevant to 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 this work where um, where the a, a user was basically holding the vase in a hand and try to basically estimate the the vase. But it's not relevant to this architecture I mentioned here. Then, as out of this work, we managed to we are in the process of publishing a survey paper on humanoid robot teleoperation. And we have also organized two full day workshops at Humanist 2019 and ICRO 2021. And uh, well, uh, now uh, at the U of D, I'm working on two different projects. One is related more to the first part of my talk where we had like peer collaboration. So here we want to accelerate scientific discovery where human provides like natural language inputs to the, to the robots and, and then robots try to perform like uh, experiments uh, autonomously and then provide some, they collect some data and do some analysis and provide feedbacks basically to the, to the, to the uh, um, scientist. Another uh, uh, project that I'm started working on is related on object-centric teleoperation, where we want to do in-hand manipulation. And we had like, uh, we would like to basically find a mapping from the human references to the object rather than, rather than the uh, motions of the fingers of the, uh, of the, of the robot hand so that we can have like, can be used also a lot for assistive robotics. And yeah, also with this video, I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, opportunity to present here. This is like a video uh, we did with, uh, with my colleagues after like three or many years of work on teleoperation. So we were doing teleoperation of the robot from Genova on the northwest of Italy to Venice. Robot was located in uh, Biennale of the Venice, was, was an event there, and around 500 kilometer distance. And we show like different features, showcase different features of our, of our system where we, we, we could, let's say, teleoperate the whole body of the robot also uh, for the uh, for the gaze for the for 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 the um, um, for the facial expressions for walking and and also hand and the manipulation and so on. So yeah, thank you. That's it. Great, uh, Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. It looks very amazing. Um, yeah. Any questions? I will be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, maybe I, I have a question is okay. um, how do you compare like the tele operation with um, other control algorithm? Like uh, in my understanding, tele operations gives you control to more degree of freedom. Uh, you need to control, like you basically have access to the, uh, to the control of every joints on the robot. Mm -hmm. And you control that using your own uh, body motion. Uh, but how do you compare that with other all control algorithms where you learn different uh, action primitives and you just uh, tell the robot to do some task and then like uh, the, learn the the algorithm can do like hierarchical planning such that he uh, pick a high level task and decompose it into different low level tasks and each task is uh, action primitives. Um, and they just, the robot just executes those primitives uh, sequentially to achieve the goal instead of uh, 
let a human to control the the the, the robot entirely, um, like to to access all it, yes. all its degree of freedom. Yeah. So um, to answer um, your question, uh, just to be just to be sure, also for for the um, the teleportation of the whole body of the robot, for example, the uh, leg joints, they were we were not controlling directly the leg joints, for example, because for, for the walking side, um, because of the stability issues, if we, and the different dynamics of the human and robot. So basically we had like higher level inputs, like the direction and the orientation of the robot walking motion. And then it was like somehow translated to the joint motion of the, of the robot. But then uh, regarding your question, um i think um depends a lot on the uh, on the task you want to do so for many scenarios maybe what uh, you're saying you're saying can be can be used and actually can be used but in some other scenarios for example if you want to do some social interaction then you may want to directly control the um basically the the robot motion in order to interact with with the user in in, in a remote environment or um in some other examples if you have like for example in a in a disaster scenario you don't know the set of let's say actions that robot needs in order to be to be basically performed in a in a remote location so in that case you may need to still Teleport the robot in order to perform and use like your cognitive capabilities in order to enable the robot to make like some basically a uh, disaster response. And also, uh, I think for most of the disaster response work, they they have been done like in in a teleportation also. Uh, they rather than more uh, higher autonomy techniques because also uh it comes to the question of also trust so if you have maybe high trust to the um, robotic system yeah you may go for a uh, higher autonomy but on the other side uh, you may try to um, go for a lower level autonomy and try to basically teleporting the joints directly somehow um uh, regarding also your points uh, for I think what you mentioned is uh, so it can be used and we are in the process of uh, developing it for some of the first part of the talk where we had like um, human robot collaboration so th this is like as, as a future work as I've mentioned before where we are going toward like higher autonomy so basically um, human robot will try to interact through like natural language and instead like actions of the robot are going to be like those action primitives are going to be learned either by interaction with the environment or human demonstration. Uh, I hope I answered the, the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's quite clear. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. Maybe it's not so related to teleop. So, oh, by the way, first of all, um, I think last time when you present in teleop group meeting, you mentioned that like your team is going to do a competition in I forgot August or October. Yes. August. Yeah. So they they it was in October actually for Anavatar Express, and I wasn't like a, a part of the finals experiment, oh. and. Uh, they as i've heard and saw some of the videos they at at the lab they managed to do all the tasks wow. but then um in the, the in the, the testing uh, basically uh, the scenario in in in, in at, at california where we were to, where they were doing the testing um also some um, um basically uh, user performance also affected the the, the total um, uh, performance of the system, and basically, um, they I think they didn't manage to finish all the all the tasks. Mm, that's a pretty, yeah. 
So like, I think a related problem is that, um, I guess nowadays we haven't seen many um, humanoid um, robots that can do a lot of tasks. Because like when I was looking at human robots, I always feel like they are not very stable, they are fragile. And so how do you think of the, like the future application of human robots compared to, you know, like a leg robot with a robot arm uh, on top of it? Or like, is there any task that uh, this kind of leg or weird um, uh, robots with weird that cannot do, but uh, we need the humanoid robot to do? Uh, yeah. How do you think of this? Yeah, I, okay, so related to that, uh, so those like uh, quadruped robots, for example, they had like uh, uh, to do like maneuvers in a, in a, in a, on a structured environment, again, in a disaster response, maybe some of those uh, basically uh, navigation or maneuver tasks, it, may, it might not be possible to do with a quadruped robot, but instead, uh, you can do it with, with a, for example, with a humanoid robot. Um, actually, Jerry Pratt has a nice paper and presentation showing a figure that, like, where like different robots can be used for, uh, like, going through different environments, and it shows like they showed that humanoid robots like had higher highest like. Uh, uh, potential capability of like traversing different types of environments, for example, uh, going up on a stairs or, 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 or doing uh, like passing by like a, a narrow uh, tunnel or something like that. On the other side, uh, also for social interaction, uh, probably having a humanoid robot can help the um, other users in front of a, of the robot have a better prediction of the robot motion and have a better understanding of that so they can make uh, uh, probably it makes it possible to have a higher quality interaction especially social interaction and also increase a bit safety because you can also predict somehow the motions of a humanoid robot, and which we you try to, uh, which which in in the case of teleoperation is going to be somehow similar to the normal human motion. So right. these are the 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 two aspects that I see that maybe humanoid robot can be used, whereas other types of robots. Uh, might be limited in their use. And um, about the fragility and stability, I completely agree with you. And still there are many works to do in order to reach in a point that we can say, okay, now we can deploy a humanoid robot to to do some 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 tasks or some tasks.